quarter going. And I must start the timer as well. Okay. All right, turning your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. What I tell you what? All right, let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the many blessings we have uh, in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for those who uh, are able to go to camp this year. We thank you for the provision made for them. Uh, from the saints here and in other churches as well. We thank you for that. We thank you for uh, the ministry to these children, and we thank you uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to give them the Word of God rightly divided. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, God's plan for every person. I, I, we've been talking about uh, encapsulation of what, what we believe in a nutshell, that sort of thing. And uh, being able to say those things is very important. Um, being able to talk about what you believe is very important. So what we've done is we've put this into four parts. One, two, three, four. And these four things give you a very good, solid, basic outline of what it is that God wants you to do with your life after you're saved. So first you get saved, then you get edified. First you get saved, then you get busy. So in, before you can get busy in ministry, before you can do some of the things that, that, that these things are going to equip you to do, uh, you have to believe the gospel. And you get saved, and you believe the gospel, and then what? You get busy and do the work of the ministry. Now, the, the, the problem today that we see a lot of times is when people are uh, working, and they're functioning in, trying to function in a local church, uh, they've got all the trappings, they've got all the things that, that, that they need as far as being religious, but uh, they're not making any headway. It's kind of like a guy who's He's in a boat race, you know, and he's got a boat. Everybody else has got a boat. He's got a motor. Everybody else has got a motor, right? He's got everything he needs, but instead of going from point A to point B, he's doing it in circles like this. He can't get anywhere, okay? So when, when you find yourself in that condition or, or you find somebody else in that condition, these four things get you back on track. They'll get you straight to where you got to go, and they need to be number one priority in your life. Your edification as far as God's concerned, is, is his number one priority for you, and it's to be your number one priority in life. And to be able to prioritize and to be able to be strong in, in making decisions about priorities, you have to do things that sometimes people don't like. They don't like it when you have priorities. If, if you don't have time for them right then, right now, or you can't do this right now, right then, <laughs> or, or you've got, they want you to do something, or whatever it is that they're trying to get you to do, and you say, no, I can't do that, or I'm not going to do that, you have a priority, and you say, I can't do that, what happens? They don't necessarily care for that. They want to be your priority. Okay, well, here's what you do. You say to them, poor planning on your part does not necessarily constitute an emergency on my part. We have priorities. We plan. And so we plan ahead, way out, okay? We've been planning for camp since last year at camp when we left. We're always planning for camp a year ahead. And so if it wasn't planned a year ahead, it wouldn't get done, okay? So people come up the last minute and they're not going to camp because they haven't planned for it. It's the same way with heaven. If you don't plan, uh, you're not going, okay? And the plan is you learn about what God has done for you and then you begin to do some things in your life that allow you to continue to grow. And without the growth, what happens? We love babies here. Nobody loves babies more than we do. Everybody loves babies in the church. And it's cute to watch them grow. It's probably, I think, the most fun part of having babies in a group is that they grow up and we watch them grow. And it's amazing if you watch Noah as he walks around in here, he, he's, he's just amazing in 24 months what that boy has gone. We, we remember the first time we saw him, and I was looking at some pictures the other day of how little he was, and, and then I look at him now and I'm going, wow, that's a lot in 24 months. They grow up quick, don't they? And, and, and as they grow up, they begin to learn, and they're learning things every day, every day, every day. Today we were trying to teach him a new phrase out in the, in the uh, hallway, and it was 
go tell daddy, time's up, okay? <laughs> or you said, all done now, right? <laughs> he doesn't want to teach him that at home, okay? But, but we're going to teach it to him here, okay? So the idea is that, yeah, time's up, Dad. But he did good. He didn't even go 40 minutes today, 40, 45 minutes. However, uh, you know, a man can say a lot in 45 minutes, can he? And uh, so it's good to do that. Uh, but, but it's good when your son is growing. It's good when your daughters are growing. It's good when your kids are growing. But they're going to grow up automatically if you just feed them and take care of them. But this is not going to happen automatically. So I got in the car today with Michael, one of the young boys that came with Denny down from Indiana. He brought four in the, in the truck with him, with his wife, and it's good to have him here. We're glad you're here safe, sound, and, well, maybe not a sound mind, but we're, we're uh, not too crazy. But, uh, yeah, to take that on, to take that on at your, two, at, at your ages, I, I'm sorry, but that's just really magnificent, okay? I give him a hard time. He's my older, older, older brother, you know. <laughs> but, but to do that, so when Michael comes, he gets in the car with me. He, him and Caleb are going to ride with me to church. And uh, so when, when, uh, when I start talking to Michael, one of the things, he, he kind of interrupts you when you're talking. I can relate to that. But he, he, he says, I'm saved. And I said, well, prove it. Tell me, what did what, you believe? And we went through the gospel. And, uh, you know, you never want to let somebody say to you, I'm saved, and then, and then leave it there on the table. Okay? Never, ever. If they kick the door open, you prop it and hold it open for them. Because what's going to happen is if you get further into that conversation and you start talking to them, you might assume they're saved, and you start talking about some of these things, okay? We, we don't want to talk about self-sufficient local churches that are independent. Oh, by the way, that word is denoms, not demons, denoms. If you rearrange it, it will spell demons, but it's denoms, denominations, no denominations. So we wouldn't talk to them about the ministry model of the local church. We wouldn't talk to them about the grace life and how to walk in the spirit. We wouldn't talk about them learning how to get edification and rightly divide the word of truth. We're going to talk to them about the cross. And, and you talk to them about the cross because it's sufficient in everything. Now, if you, if you talk about the sufficiency of the cross, well, we're talking about the sufficiency of cross to live. We're not talking about it to save under this heading right here. So once you get saved by the cross and you understand the sufficiency of it, the sufficiency of God's grace to bring it to you and the message to you and the sufficiency of the scriptures for you to trust it, then you can, at that point, at that level, you, you can learn all of this, but you got, first you've got to learn about the sufficiency of the cross to save you. And once we had this little interrogation time over with, uh, it, it was pretty clear he was saved. And it's a good thing. Because uh, I told him, I said, well, where you're going to be swimming, it's, you need to be saved, okay? <laughs> because we got some pretty good-sized gators in that lake up there, and I've been talking to them about gators. They, they got, they've got this new adventure going on in Florida today that they're here this weekend and uh, this week. And this is, there's just not as many things in Indiana that eat you like they do here. We have sharks and gators and, you know, other things. But, but to have them at camp, oh, that's really exciting. Um, so anyway, they're, they're here to learn, and we hope you do the same. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and did I say 1 Timothy? No, I, I said 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, I'm sorry, I, I don't know why it is I get those two mixed up, I guess it has to do with the word Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, and here's what we're going to talk about first. We are, in all of these things that we learn, it is to help us understand that we are called to serve. We're called not to live our own life, but to serve. Now notice what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He tells young Timothy, he says in verse 4, he says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Three generations of faithful people there, okay? 
And he goes on to say in verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. What did Paul do with Timothy? He ordained him, number one. But when he got to Eunice and Lois's place and he met him, and he met the young man whose father was a Greek, by the way, the first thing he did so that the Jews where he lived would listen to the message given to Paul is he circumcised him. And then he took him away from his mother and grandmother and took him on the road. And his life changed completely as he grew up with Paul on the missionary trail. That's how he grew up. He was a young man. And he's talking to him, as you see here, as a son in the faith. And he says, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us. Now notice verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, as you begin to, to see, as you read 1 Timothy, things are falling apart pretty bad. When you read 2 Timothy, they're falling down, okay? And they're coming down around everybody's ears. And Paul ends the book. If you go over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, uh, you'll see that the, 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 one of the saddest statements that you'll ever read is verse 10. He says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Well, it was a good thing because he had a doctor with him in prison. That was a good thing. Uh, he's dying when he's writing this passage right here. He's, in the, he's getting ready to be offered, and he's getting ready to, to go home to be with the Lord. And uh, he finished his course, he says, with joy, and he's ready to go. When a, when a priest in Israel worked the work of a priest, he was inducted at 30, he retired at 50, he did a 20-year stint, and he had a course that he ran. And he didn't, he didn't run track like that, that sort of course. What he did is he had a course of work. Like when you get a meal, it's a five-course meal, they bring the appetizer and then they'll bring you the salad and then they'll bring you know and, and it's a course and you go through that course and then you start the next course well the priests would come to Jerusalem each year for a three or four month period and they would they would do their work in the the temple there and they would whatever it is they were called to do and they would maybe light incense and, and take care of all that maybe they slaughtered animals uh, and gave and worked on the blood sacrifices uh, maybe they were teachers maybe they were doing whatever and what they did in the temple service under the levitical system and under that ironic priesthood what they did they did in course and then when they were done with that they went back home and then they usually at that point would they might teach in synagogues they might uh, have their own bible studies there where they were they may be the local person in their community that would be able to help them with the things of god and so forth and, and they might farm uh, or have a trade of some sort so they would come down and they would serve just like you would go serve in the military and then go home okay you go to washington and serve and, and come back home that's what we want all of our politicians to do today is go back home okay uh, they've served it long enough. Guys in there 50, 60 years, you know, get out. And we, we need you to be gone. Well, they, they need to go home after their time. They run their course. When Paul says, I finished my course, he says, I'm done. I've, I'm going to do everything God told me to do. And he did it. So you're called to serve the Lord. Your life is not designed for you to kick back and make decisions uh, in such a way that, that it just gets you to retirement and then you've got enough money to get you through retirement. If you watch television, they're always trying to get people to work on their retirement issues. And they say, are you going to outlive your retirement money? That's a, they, they act like that's the end of the world. Okay. Well, 
you know, some people look at that and they say, I need to plan more wisely for that. Some people look at it and they say, oh, I got plenty. And some people go, I don't even know what you're talking about. What is retirement? There is no retirement for some people. And so there is this idea of, of looking at, at your life in the future and being able to say, what am I going to do with it now that I'm saved? You're not only called to serve, but you're sanctified to service. You're sanctified by God, and that's really what the word sanctified means. It means to be set apart and to be used for God's intended purpose. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. And we'll start in verse 19. He says, what? Now, what's the what for? <laughs> well, the what is kind of like a therefore. You've got to back up a little bit. Uh, now, notice what he says. Go back down to verse um, 15. He says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So the Corinthians had some problems with fornication. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, I wrote to you about this issue about fornication. And he says in verse 16, he says, what? <laughs> and he says, should we, should we have those in the body of Christ, should they be able to, to just get by with all this? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? Should, should that be allowed? And people say, well, you can't tell me what to do. I'm not under the law. Well, that doesn't mean you're under the law of Moses. That doesn't mean you're not under the law for blessings and cursings. That means you're not under God's law for contractual agreement for you to get blessed and, and you to get cursed. That's what not being under the law means. Now, the law has been taken care of at Calvary by the Lord Jesus Christ. Over here on the chart, we would look at the cross and say, hey, that's where he nailed the law to, right there, to the cross. But we are still and always will be under the edict of a God who lives in us, and he is a God of many, many things, and one of them is laws. And there are several laws that you just can't get around. The law of sin and death, for instance. Where sin is present, death follows. And you learn that you get delivered from that by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There are, there are immutable laws, and there are immutable laws that cannot be broken. For instance, you know, God cannot lie. That's a law. I mean, it's part of his nature. He can't do it. He, he cannot lie, and, and he, he is, it is not possible for him to lie. His character, his holiness, his righteousness, all of those things, those are all things that, that we look at in the Scripture and we say, well, I'm not under the law, but, yeah, but that doesn't mean you have a license to walk in sin. So, is fornication something you want your children to do? No, of course not. It's a virtuous thing to have a woman of virtue. I think every man, that's the way he wants his wife when he marries her. And so, Paul deals with the issue, and you, boy, there's a lot more to it than just, just right here. If you go back to chapter 5, verse 1, he says, It is com reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. This was a real problem of fornication because the two people that were involved in it, it was incestuous and it was terrible. And Paul says that this is not even, this is something even the Gentiles shun. Now he's talking about the heathen Gentiles, not the people in the local church, which is who he's talking to when he writes 1 Corinthians. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He's talking to a bunch of people here that had a lifestyle that was so crazy and, and, and out of whack and messed up. He says, because of this lifestyle that you've got, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you are dying. Some of you are sleeping, he says. He says, this life that you live of revelry and all this kind of activity and all this stuff, this has got to be completely purged out of this group. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in Corinth was doing that. He's talking about the local church. Look at... Uh, Verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. 
with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be to you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is great. You say, well, they're sanctified. Yeah, they're sanctified by God to do the work of the ministry. You're sanctified by God to serve. You're sanctified by God to live holy. But that doesn't mean you always think that way, and it doesn't mean you'll always act that way. However, when you think about this a little bit, you realize that Paul's working through this, and he's trying to teach them that this is their old lifestyle, but it's not an acceptable way. It's not right. It's unrighteous. You'll see Paul say things like, so saith the law. When you see people quoting the Old Testament like Paul, and he quotes it more than anybody else, if you go back here and you quote it, and you're talking about something that's under the law, is he saying now you're under that? No, he's saying this is how God thinks on the matter, and God doesn't change on those issues. Now, does God change on the issue of the Sabbath? Yes, he does. He will not, uh, he does not put you under an edict today in the dispensation of grace whereby you're stoned if you don't keep the Sabbath day. That's why we ask the question, well, who changed the Sabbath? God did. We don't worship on the seventh day. Okay, we're here on the first day of the week, which is what day is that? If you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you start on the next day, that's the eighth day, right? Well, Israel's program runs on a Sabbath program. In other words, it runs seven days. This program of Israel runs seven days, and this thousand-year millennial kingdom is the Sabbath period in which God comes to earth and lives with his people. So 6,000 years comes up to this point, and then there's a, a, a Sabbath here, and then there's another one after this, by the way. Now, this one over here that he starts with on Adam, he talks about six days, and on the seventh you rest. And every single work week that every Israelite ever lived through was to teach them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, they worship the finished, what? Creation, because that's what they inherit. But for us, we don't worship a finished creation. We worship a finished what? Redemption. And what happens on the first day of the week here? The cross ends with resurrection, doesn't it? And so we're not into the Sabbath. We don't have to participate in the Sabbath. And we don't stone people for not keeping the Sabbath. Neither do the Seventh-day Adventists, by the way. And they claim you keep the Sabbath. However, there are many things in God's Word that are they're, they're not changeable. They're, they're consistent throughout all the dispensations. And, and living an illicit lifestyle is one of them. That doesn't change. It's always wrong to do that. Okay? It's always wrong to lie. It's always wrong to do those things. So when He calls you by the Gospel to serve... He wants you to separate your life so that you can go meet people that are living like that. He's not talking about you getting away from all those kind of people. He's talking about you being able to go in among those kind of people with a different lifestyle and reach them. Israel was to be separate from the nations so they could reach the nations. That's the whole idea. So sanctification is really kind of two parts. It's you're sanctified by God when you get saved, you're sanctified by him to serve, and that sanctification has nothing to do with what you do. It's what he did to you. So if I sanctify this, this bottle of water and I set it aside over here for me to drink, that's what it's for. And I've sanctified it for that. Now, whether I use it properly or not, that's the different thing. But that's what it's for. That's its purpose. For us today to live sanctified in Christ Jesus, it takes some learning so you can understand how God accomplishes that in your life. Okay? So we're called by the gospel to serve. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and notice what he says in verse... We'll work our way down, and notice what he says about this issue. Oh, this is great for teens at camp. They, they need to hear this. I mean, more than once a year, too, believe me. He says, what? Verse 16, Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Sounds like a marriage meeting, doesn't it? 
kind of interesting. You go back and look at Abraham, and everybody knows his wife is Sarai, later called Sarah. That's his wife. But when he takes Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid, who he has Ishmael through, and, and his wife puts him up to this thing, he does it. And you know what happens? Hagar is called Abraham's wife. Now, just, just having illicit relationship with somebody doesn't make them your wife, legally. But the act of marriage does make them your wife practically. Okay? So you have to be careful when you start stepping over that line okay, and saying, hey, uh, yeah, that's it. We'll just do that freely. Well, verse 17, he says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That's why he says in verse 18, you are now separated, you see. He says in verse 18, flee fornication. He says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now, what's the problem with that? You say, it's my body, I can do whatever I want to with it. That's the big cry today. You know, they paint it from one side up, one side down. They paint the whole thing just like a heathen. Then they say, well, I can do whatever I want to do. I can, I can make all the decisions I want to make about my own body. Really? Well, okay, if that's the way you look at it, look at verse 19. What, he says, know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Why aren't you your own? Verse 20 explains that. He says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, instead of living this kind of life, he says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to him. And so he wants you to start demonstrating that, and it's a matter of obedience. Look at chapter 7 and look at verse 23. Uh, we need to read 22 with that. For he that is called, this is a great verse, for he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. So let's say you're born into slavery. You say, I'm a slave. I'm just born into slavery. Maybe you lived during the Civil War prior to it, and you haven't participated in the Emancipation Proclamation, and you don't, you don't consider yourself a free man. But when you get put into Jesus Christ, what are you? Look what he says. Being a servant, he is what? The Lord's free man. Now, how are you supposed to keep yourself free? Free from all encumbrances. You're supposed to keep yourself free from those who would what? Put you under bondage. You don't want them to have anything on you except a good report. You don't want them to have anything bad to say about you, though that they may be ashamed, Paul says. You're bought with a price, he says. You're, you're being free, if you look at that, he says also, in verse 22, he says also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. You're bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called there abide with God. So he's talking about your priorities. He's talking about who you now are. He's talking about your identity. You're not to serve men. If you seek to please men, you're not the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you seek to please money and gain money, you're not the servant. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve God in other people. You've got to, you, the only way you can serve God is to understand you're called by him to serve and understand that you're sanctified by him to serve. And you say, well, I just can't do it. I just don't do it. Every time I want to do this, I do that. And every time I want to do that, I do this. And, and I just can't do it. Well, you've got to understand some more that you have power in your life to what? Not only to serve, but to live. You've got power given to you in order to accomplish this. Over the years, I've been, <laughs> I've been given the privilege over the years to explain this to people who had sin problems. A lot of people in ministry come to you and they got sin problems. They just got problems, okay? And uh, it, it's usually their addictions or, or they, they, they got attitude issues, anger issues, 
Uh, we had a young man here. You might have remembered him. Um, he just lived down off Park Boulevard here in a, in a guy's garage. And uh, he started coming to church. He came in for the store. And uh, really nice kid. He was really a super nice kid. And, uh, and he was here, and he was really struggling with temper and anger. He had some anger issues. And uh, he came in the store after we had seen him a while. He, he was trying to get to work. And this guy uh, cut across the street, and he was riding his bike down the sidewalk, on, um, on, right on down on Park Boulevard, and he had to hit his brakes real hard. And uh, he did, and he flipped his bike, and he knocked his front teeth out. Now, if you remember him, he was sitting here with, he, he broke his palate in two also. He cracked his palate in like two or three places. And I, 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 I was with him down at the hospital when he needed, he went down there to get fixed, and I went down there to pick him up, got his bicycle, took him home trying to help him out. He had a dog. He had, a, he had to constantly take care of his dog because him and his dog were very tight. And, uh, but this boy was living on his own and he was down here away from his family and he's trying to get it together. Okay. He, he, he married a girl who went, who, whose father was a pastor and had a ministry and, and it just didn't work out. And so he, he found himself away from his child, away from his wife, uh, estranged and he's and he's alone and he doesn't have anybody and what he's doing is he's struggling with his power because he doesn't have the power to to keep his anger under control and as I began to go through some of these issues that we're looking at here today and I began to share those with him he didn't respond real well he did not believe any of it I mean he just like nah I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> and then about the third time I talked to him about it and he started coming to church a little bit and we began to talk and he'd come by the, the, the shop and we'd sit and study and sometimes he he'd look at a verse and then and, 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 and I'd say to him now do you believe what God says in that verse about that that's what it says and he, he had respect for the Word of God he believed it and so after a little while, this is about two or three months of this, he finally started getting excited about it. He really kind of, well, he started getting excited because he began to overcome some things. And he was talking, he's working day labor. So he, he does construction work and he's going out working for these guys doing construction work and stuff. And some of the stuff that happens on the job, oh boy, he's, and he'd come in and he'd tell me about some of the things that he could have done had he been acting normal, he would have just laid this guy out, okay? Or he would have taken this guy and, you know, whatever. And I said, well, you overcame the, the anger about it? And he said, yeah, I did. And he began to chat about it. When he got his teeth knocked out, I thought he was going to be pretty upset about that. And uh, he actually did pretty good with that. But he finally, uh, it, it turned around on him because uh, they not only fixed his palate and put it back the way it should be, but uh, he got a new set of teeth out of it, okay? And his teeth were messed up to begin with. Uh, no, they should have been taken out instead of knocked out. But he, he got new ones, and that was kind of a blessing for him. But, you know, I said, look, you need to be happy, and you need to smile, okay? And uh, it was kind of sad because while we were laughing about some of these things, he'd cover his mouth when he'd laugh because he had this big, giant gap with no teeth there. And he was having trouble. The guy was down. But, but what he did learn is he did begin to understand that God the Holy Spirit is not in you just to hang out. He's here to run your life. That's what he's to do. That's what he says. Paul talks about this. He says, you know, if, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit in, in us, we would all be reprobates. Okay? God the Holy Spirit is the thing that energizes the Christian life. It's the thing that, that stops sin. Now, if Calvary can take care of all the sins of all mankind from beginning to end for every single individual, don't you think that God the Holy Spirit actually taking up residence in you could stop just sin in your life? It stopped it all right there at Calvary. So now when you apply Calvary and you get saved, God the Holy Spirit comes in and He dwells in you and there's that power. Look over Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. There's a lot going on in Romans 5. What a great book, huh? What a great chapter. Well, take a look at this verse. 
This is brand new information if you're reading through the book of Romans for the very first time. This is brand new. Look at verse... Well, let's start in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's great news. He says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 3, we're over there reading that all have sinned and fall, and, call, and fall short or come short of the glory of God. But here we're learning about not falling short. We're, we're learning about not coming up short. We're learning that we can rejoice in this. And he says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, what? It works, what? Experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because, now notice this verse. He says, because the love of God is what? How, how do you learn about it? It's shed abroad, what? In our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. There's the first time you read about the Holy Ghost in Paul's epistles and what? The first time you read about him living in you like that mentions, it's mentioned one time in the first eight chapters of Romans that's the verse right there. That's a great verse because you're now learning how the love of God is communicated to you. Uh, this morning when Michael was giving me his testimony, he kept saying over and over, he says, it's in my heart, I believe it in my heart. He knew the difference between head and heart. See? This is hell, this is heaven. There's only that much difference in, in space between heaven and hell. Okay? You believe it in your head, you're going to hell. You believe it in your heart, you go to heaven. So here the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now turn over to chapter 8. Now we don't have time to go down through these and we are going to do that eventually. I have tried to go through a few of them with you but we need to just focus on one six month period and go down through here. In Romans chapter 8 See if you can go through Romans 8, the whole 39 verses, and find the 19 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned. He's mentioned in connection with you getting the power to live godly in Christ Jesus. So you don't need to worry about finding the power and the will and all of that. It's already there. You've been given a free will. You can make that decision. But not just the decision, but God gives you the power to do it. You need the power. If you've got a judge, and he says, I make a decree right now that I'm going to rule in this case, and he says to this corporation over here, you're guilty of this, this, and this, and you owe this person here one million dollars and we find for the plaintiff. You owe him a million bucks. And you get an order for that, and, and you get a judgment of that, and then what do you have to do? You gotta collect it. So if somebody gives you, if an order writes, a, 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 a judge gives you a court order, does that give you the money? No. It gives you the right to exercise those who have the authority to go get the money. And then what happens is they'll go get it. So you have to maybe do some other things and you go and you jump through the hoops and what do they do? They say, you have 30 days to pay that or we're going to pull it out of your bank account, okay? Or we're going to seize your assets and take it. You see, without the military, without the, without the police, without those strong arm officials that can go get you the thing, you can have all the, 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 the choices and all that stuff can be made, and you can have the thing positionally, but somebody's got to have the power to go get it. You can declare war on people all the time, but unless you've got an army, I'd be watching out before you making stuff, you know, statements like that. Because you've got to back it up. Well, let me tell you that God backs it up.
he always backs it up. He hasn't left you out in the cold to, to serve him as a person who's called by the gospel and, and, and sanctified you to accomplish that without giving you the power to do that. That's a wonderful thing. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We've got to get going here. We're just about done. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is just one aspect of what edification does for you, okay? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verse 9. He says, this is really a, a good ministry-oriented verse here. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the, this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. You can't get away from these people. I'm not telling you not to sit next to them on the bus or, or not to eat with them in a restaurant or whatever, because they're lost. We don't treat them that way. We have no right to treat them that way. I mean, God's not imputing their trespasses unto them, so why should we? But you say, well, what about us in the local church? What about us who live in this self-sufficient local church that is independent, that's got, a, that's got a, 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 a mission in its purpose? He says, I'm not talking about you staying away from the world. But verse 11 says, but now I have, what? Written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, notice, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, that's people who talk about other people in a bad way, or a drunkard or an extortioner, people that put pressure on you, okay, to pay up or to do whatever, make, them, make you do what they want you to do by pressure. He says, with such an one know not to eat. So now, you, now from those two verses, you know who to eat with and who you can't eat with. You see? If this is going on in the local church, you teach them that. This is, this is also one of the verses and one of the, the areas that you look at that brings about what we call the second degree sanctification or second degree separation. That means if... If I am separating from them, so should you. Okay? If, you, if you're going to stand with us and we make these decisions, then you should stand with us in that. And we had to make a stand like that in 1997 here at Suncoast, and we had 27 people had to leave because we put out one person. And uh, they were all in agreement that what they did was okay. <laughs> I said, not here, it didn't. And I used those verses right there. And, and, and it got strong. And I had to go all the way back. In a letter we wrote him, the board wrote him, we quoted the law of Moses. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You don't do that in a local church, and you don't get by with it. Now, if you'll read the saga in 1 Corinthians and then go to 2 Corinthians and read it, you'll find out that this young man that did this is brought back. Restoration is always a part of grace, isn't it? God's grace, what we teach here, doesn't produce the kind of thing that just keeps kicking people out the door. <laughs> the idea is we bring them back. If they can come back, they'll come back. They can be forgiven. Paul says, hey, I am certain that he's ready. He's, he's completely ready. Paul turned him over to the, to the Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He says, you want that? You go out and get it. My dad caught me smoking cigars one time. He caught me smoking uh, cigars. He caught me smoking cigarettes. And he caught me chewing tobacco one time, too. He didn't have to tell me anything about the tobacco. That was nutty. I was stupid on my part. But the, but the little bitty cigar with the funny little tip on the end, I thought that was pretty cool. And my older brother, 
not the one that's here now. He was smoking those things. They were cherry flavored, pretty nice. And uh, I began to smoke those, and my dad thought that was not good. And it was hard for him to say anything to me because he smoked cigarettes. So it was hard for him to tell me not to smoke cigars. I said, what's the problem? <laughs> what's the problem, Dad? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, he, he sat there and he says, I want you to smoke that. I said, okay. So we smoked it. He says, I want you to smoke it good. Okay. And uh, he was going to try to get me to smoke the whole thing. Well, about halfway down, I'm turning green. About the color of my phone right there. And uh, I never smoked another one of those things again, ever, okay? Now, I want to tell you something. <laughs> you get a taste of something, and then you get too much of it, and you won't want any more of it, okay? God did that with Israel with idolatry. He sent them down to Babylon, and after 70 years, they had enough of it. This boy, he was put out for what he did. He turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. And he says, if you want to live your life that way, then you go out in the world and you live like that and you be like that all you want. And if missing us here in the local church, if missing all this is not enough to bring you back, then that's your, that's your lot in life. Go ahead. But you come back, and this is true repentance for a believer, when you make those decisions to come back, what happens? you begin to serve again. And Paul says we do that so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Saved from what? Not from hell. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ over here that occurs after we go up in the rapture that when that young man would get there he would have this little black mark on his record which was by the way taken care of at Calvary already. But we want that little black mark to be a short period in his life, not a long one. Because we don't want him to be out of service for this long. We want him to be out of service for a short time only to learn the lesson and then come back. You see? Isn't it better when a, when a dad tells his father or when a father tells his son to do something? And which one is better? When the son says, no, I won't do it. And then he goes and he changes his mind and he does it. Or if he says, yeah, I'll do it, and then he doesn't do it. Which one's better? There's a change of mind and attitude, and what happens is these things continually help you learn how to rethink the way you think and start changing that thinking pattern. Let's close with this one. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. And the way this works is you begin to cut sin off at its well, below the knees, and you, 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 you do that, it gets no traction. And what he says here is very important. But Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, all that God has done for you at Calvary, that you present your bodies not as a dead sacrifice like they put on the altar in Israel's program. It's a living, walking, breathing talking, preaching, teaching, loving, singing, gracious sacrifice. A person who is living a life of sacrifice. What are they giving up? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. What are they giving up in life? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23. Notice the testimony here. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They're not going to listen to men, they're listening to God, right? Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer afflictions of the, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What does that tell you about Egypt's lifestyle? under Pharaoh. The pleasures of sin is what they did. He says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward by faith. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, 
he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea to dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. Wow, what a testimony. You see what he does is he forsakes Egypt. And as I told you, Egypt is always a type of the world in the Bible. You know how they say about Detroit? So goes GM, so goes the country. How's GM doing? GM's doing great. Country's going up. Mom's back there going like that because they just kept her car for 67 days trying to fix it. She's not too happy with GM. Uh, by the way, when, when I was down there getting the car, uh, there was a whole bunch of other people down there really mad about what was going on. Okay, so <laughs> those people got a rough way, uh, rough way to go down there. I'm going to tell you something. You know, there are barometers like this in life. So when you, start seeing, when you start seeing things in Egypt, you see the world's in turmoil. Is Egypt in turmoil right now? Yes. Is the world itself in turmoil? Yes. They coincide. Isn't that weird? It's kind of like a thermometer when you go outside and read it. You know, God's barometers, God's thermometers, whatever, they're all here in the scriptures for you to look at and to understand. Now, finish up with me on, in Romans chapter 12 because... This living sacrifice will not crawl off the altar. He'll walk in the Spirit. And the reason he'll walk in the Spirit, Romans chapter 12 again, the reason he'll walk in the Spirit is he can change his mind. She can change her mind. He can change his mind. Notice what he says. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notice what he says your bodies. Why? Because that's the place that God, somewhere between the, the bottom of your feet and the top of your head, God the Holy Spirit lives in you. And in that spiritual entity of God the Holy Spirit, that person of the Godhead, you have access to God the Father and God the Son. See, the, the Trinity never, the, the, the Godhead never goes anywhere without each other. And when they live in you, they all three live in you, and that's why you're a habitation of God through the Spirit, Paul says, and that's how that's done. But he says here, present your bodies, a living sacrifice. This is important for unmarried people. It's important for married people, isn't it? It's important for all people. It's important for widows. It's important for everybody because, as Paul says, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. He says... A living sacrifice, holy, you see, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the most logical, most reasonable thing you can do for him, is to do what he asks you to do. So he doesn't ever ask you to do something that he doesn't give you the power to do. So here it is. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change your mind. Think on these things, not those things. And he says that ye may prove, now this is beautiful, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One more verse. Turn over to, uh, this one is not on the program, okay? One of the things you, one of the great benefits of Bible study is you, verses come to your attention without a concordance. They just pop up. And here's one of them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Beautiful passage. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In light of you getting taken out in the rapture, here's what he wants you to do. Uh, Schofield calls this the model walk and the believer's hope. But look what he says. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, sounds similar to Romans 12, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Keep going, in other words. Don't stop. He says, for ye know what commandments we gave you. Now notice this verse, by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Look up the word commandment and the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul's epistles and you're going to get a whole list of things that God says, this is not a suggestion. This is for your understanding. Get me on this, okay? He says, look, he says, for this is the will of God, verse 3, even your sanctification, this is where it all begins, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, that's your body, by the way, he says, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, evil thinking, even as the Gentiles which know not God, you see? You see, there's this beautiful thing that you have available to you, and it's a sad thing to not use it. God, the Holy Spirit, will stop sin in your life just like that. Now, you will never, ever become sinless in this body, and we don't claim that. But you can sin less and sin less and sin less to the point to where you'll have some people listen to you on these things as you're trying to teach it to them, and then when they start looking at your body and they walk up to you and they go, you say, I'm not perfect, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I am saved. I do have the Holy Spirit. And I am studying a little bit to try to learn these things just like you need to be doing. And if you do that the right way, you will bring tremendous credibility to the message that you preach. And you know, that credibility is really important because people want to, they want to trust you. You know, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Yes, it is. And so you got to give people something to put some confidence in. You give them the word of God for that. So when it comes to the sanctification of the sin issue, it's not... I'm this way and you're that way, it's we're all this way and we can all be this way if we want to. It's a choice. You're free. You're the Lord's free man. You can choose to do whatever you want to do, whether you're slave or whether you're free in the, in the, in the community that you live in. It doesn't matter. You're always free to believe God's word and you're always free to obey it. Okay? God doesn't take that away. They can take away everything you've got, and they cannot take away that, because to, in order to take that away, they have to kill you to do it. And by the way, in our Bible, when you, when you go to be with the Lord, that's considered early retirement. That's a reward. Okay? That's not a bad thing. As Denny said it this morning, to die is gain. Okay? But being sanctified in service is also gain. All right? Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word of God that can teach us these things about how to use what we've learned more effectively and more efficiently. We thank you, Lord, that there's a need for good testimonies to be able to uh, talk to people and, and, and not, not tout the idea that we're any better than they are or, or that we're sinless in any way, shape, or form, but rather we are imperfect people trusting in you to do the work through us, that we may be sanctified spirit, soul, and body, and holy, so that we be uh, able, that we may be able to, to do the things you would have us to do. And we thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay.